The Sage of Six Paths is the first and most venerated shinobi in all of Naruto. I think my boy Hamada needs some more attention too. As a little brother myself, sometimes the little tree needs some light too, am I right? Anyway, the Sage of Six Paths was the creator of Ninshu, a form of ninjutsu whose only technique was Taknojutsu. Alright, maybe I jest a little. Hagoromo had a lot of cool techniques, but at the core of his philosophy was connection. To understand people on a deeper level. Not so much the fun facts about them, such as their birthday or anything like that though. I assume you get bonus points for knowing these things. He preferred to know people on an emotional level and build a bond of love. This was something his son, Ashura, managed to do in all of his incarnations. But there are times when I wonder what would have happened had Hamada and Hagoromo as well as Indra and Ashura traded places. What if Naruto were the Sage of Six Paths? Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Her name was Kaguya Otsutsuki, the rabbit goddess. She was beautiful, loving, kind, uncaring, cold, merciless. These were the things often used to describe her. But the rabbit goddess, of whom they did not remember where she came from, was pregnant. Yes, she had two little divine peas in her pod. After Tsukiyomi had been cast, many humans regained their autonomy, but had been forced to forget everything that happened. They went about their lives. Now, Kaguya was a different flavor of Otsutsuki altogether. I suppose compared to her brethren, she would be considered a saint, but when compared by human standards, she appeared as a cruel deity who every so often demanded a blood sacrifice to satiate her lust for power. But who was she really? Why? Her methods were so unorthodox. Why did she not end the world? Was it because there was no moon? No, surely there was another reason. Perhaps it wasn't because she desired power, but because she needed it. You see, Kaguya loved humanity, but she loved herself more. Self-preservation, pure and simple. Perhaps in her mind, she had some semblance of an excuse, like she was protecting humanity. But essentially, what we saw here was Kaguya having her cake and trying to eat it too. She wanted to keep humanity alive, but also wanted to drain them of their power. So she was slow to feed her tentails. Was it because she wanted them to survive? Or perhaps she just wanted humanity to reproduce long enough to increase the number of souls on the surface of the planet at any given time. Regardless, she didn't kill them all. But there had been a time when she loved humanity more than herself. She killed Ishiki over it. But instead of usurping the fruit immediately, she instead held off to live among the humans. As if she couldn't decide if they should live or die. It was at that time that she met Tenji. He was an emperor. A powerful man. Well, powerful by human standards. And that wasn't really all that powerful compared to an Otsutsuki, but alas, she became one of his concubines. She lived with him for a while, and now he's dead because of a dispute, but also Kageyasama is preggers now. So I'm sure you understand. She sits as a queen, but soon shall have heirs. She eventually gives birth, and the eldest she names Indra, and the youngest she names Ashura. The two boys grow in her shadow. They too possess chakra, which was irksome to Kaguya. But being a mother, she loved her babies and would not take it away from them, as removal of their chakra would surely result in their deaths. Uniquely, one of the babies possessed her eyes, Indra. The other though, he was different, kind of a dud. Poor boy was weak and not very smart and had the luck of an ice cream cone in a volcano. But there was something within him that was pure, innocent. As the children grew, Indra would always display his independence, while Ashura was always the one waddling to Kaguya, hoping to get in her lap. It was because of this loving nature that she could never turn her back on Ashura. The Otsutsuki weren't like other clans. They didn't really have a strong relationship with anybody in their clan. If you weren't strong, you were sent to become Jubi Chowder for someone stronger. As she looked back on her life though, she realized that she wasn't that different from little Ashura. She had no strength or power, but the heart within this child warmed her from the core to the extremities. His chakra was being used differently. He wasn't using it to make fire or lightning or control the elements like mischievous little Indra was doing. No, he was using his chakra to connect with Mami. 
In these little mother-son bonding moments, it was as if they'd become one person again. She could sense his emotions as he could sense hers, and her heart felt all the more full for it. There had been a time when she had considered taking the chakra back after their birth, but now she felt like a fool for ever having considered that. If she had, she'd be missing out on this. But suddenly, Ashura's eyes opened up as he looked up at her with his pure white Byakugan. He shook a little, Kaguya sensed that he was feeling afraid. It was then that she realized her mind had wandered back to the Ten Tails, back to the Otsutsuki, back to Momoshiki. Her anxiety was causing the little fella grief, so she took a couple deep breaths and focused her mind back on Ashura. The boy began to smile again. She would rock her sons to sleep at night and sing them an ancient lullaby she had once heard as a child. A song about the countless stars, about taking it all in your hand and being the best that you could possibly be. But alas, the tone in which she sang it was different. The song was originally about conquering other worlds, about killing and evolving into an ultimate creature. Kaguya no longer felt like she wanted to evolve and conquer. She was happy here on Earth with Indra and Ashura, and if she never saw another Otsutsuki, it would be too soon. But now she felt like she needed to evolve, because she knew eventually the stronger among them would come. She needed to be ready. She wasn't weak at the moment by any means, but she knew that by the time Momoshiki showed up, she would be outclassed. So she needed it. She needed another chakra fruit, and sadly, that demanded sacrifice. For her, she sang a new song for them. A song where the world was in their hands. Not to conquer or destroy or harm, but to explore and learn, and be the best they could possibly be. She wanted them to be happy and to be who they wanted. She looked at Indra. Honestly, she knew he was a free spirit in his own right, but she had hoped he would learn from Ashura. This was part of the be the best that you can be part of the song. These two brothers were twins, cut from the same cloth, half of the same whole. She just wanted them to be happy and to learn from one another. She so desperately wanted to see what was inside of Indra's heart, but that he kept closely guarded. Not even Ashura was let inside, and everyone let him inside. The boy had essentially become her empire's mascot. She kissed them both to sleep. As the boys grew, they became wiser and stronger, but not in equal measure. The boys were like fire and ice, but some things never changed. Anytime Kaguya turned around, Ashura was around her waist in a hug. He was her sunshine. Anytime she remembered the Otsutsuki, he was there. It's like he sensed when she was terrified and hugged his mother to give her comfort. And that's exactly what she felt. But all the while, Indra from the outside would look in on them. He would watch Kaguya laugh with Ashura and hold him high in the air. He would watch her sit him on her lap. But more than once, Indra would walk in and sit on his mother's lap and she almost showed annoyance at this. What was wrong with him? Why didn't she like him as much as Ashura? The sun was shining overhead and Kaguya stood between her children. She hoped that it would never come to pass, but she knew without a doubt that if it ever did occur and Kaguya couldn't defend them, they needed to be ready to defend themselves. And so sparring was always the cure. Ashura was having a hard time keeping up with Indra, and Kaguya was beginning to simply believe that Ashura was a lover, not a fighter. Unlike his brother, who was a fighter and less a lover. But as the spar began, she noticed unusual ferocity in Indra's actions. Slow down, Indra. Your brother can't keep up, she said. He looked to his mother, his Sharingan active. He needs to learn or he'll never be good for anything. Kaguya noticed this in his eyes. There was hatred. Kaguya stood. Stop this, Indra. Indra weaved hand signs and breathed out a large puff of fire. Ashura raised his arms to defend himself. He didn't know any ninjutsu and Indra knew this. There was a cry as the flames touched flesh. A huge gust of wind suddenly blew the flames out. Kaguya ran over to Ashura to look at him. In her rage, she turned around and backhanded Indra. Get out of my sight before I reclaim the chakra I gave you, she shouted at the boy on the ground. Indra was startled by this outburst, and for the first time since he was a baby, Indra began to cry. He got up and ran off. Kaguya knelt down by Ashura. The left side of his body, as well as the palm of his right hand, was burned. He was wailing, tears of agony going down his cheeks. Kaguya went to pick him up, but her touch caused him to recoil in pain. She looked down at him. Ashura! She began attempting to heal his wounds. The process wasn't easy for either of them. To heal, Kaguya had to lay hands on him, which caused Ashura to wail in pain. She couldn't help but shed tears with every moment that passed by, because as Ashura was in pain, he subconsciously started vibing out the pain he was in through his chakra. Perhaps a self-defense mechanism designed to tell people he was hurt without being able to talk. And as Kaguya took it in, she felt all of his emotions his physical pain and his emotional pain. 
Indra's attack had not only hurt his skin, but his heart. There was confusion, as if Ashura was asking why his brother would hurt him like this, and there was sorrow, feeling like he was being hated for no reason. Kaguya kept up the process, and eventually she managed to heal her son. However, there were some scars still left on his body, and these scars were painful. After that, there was no more sparring. In fact, she prohibited Indra from practicing ninjutsu anymore. Her harsh words hurt Indra too. One night, he crawled out the window. The boy would rush off into the night towards the mountains. He wanted to be alone. Where best could he go other than to the god tree? Nobody ever went there. Nobody would ever suspect him of going there. He climbed the mountain under cover of night, the full moon the only thing leading him. All the while, Kaguya was in her bed. This night, she was letting Ashura sleep with her. She knew his scars hurt, so she was using her own chakra to numb the pain. His chipper self had not returned. These scars had not healed, and she wondered if ever she could get them to heal. The first step was making Indra make up with him, but therein lay the issue. She didn't know if she could trust Indra anymore, and worse, she didn't even know if Indra was remorseful at all. Yes, he cried, but were those tears of remorse, or tears because he got yelled at? As she thought about it, she began to think that maybe she was a little too rough on him. It was a mother's duty to punish her child when they did evil, but she did threaten to take his chakra away, and both she and Indra knew that this was a death sentence. Her heart began to ache, knowing that she had told her own child that she was going to kill him. She called a servant to the room. When the servant entered, Kaguya slipped out of bed and whispered, telling the maidservant to stay by Ashura and to let him know that mommy was just going to talk with Indra, and that she would be back soon. The servant woman nodded and sat by the bed. Kaguya walked through the house to Indra's room. The door was closed. She opened up the door to see a lump under the covers. She walked in and knelt down by the bed. Indy, she asked. Indy, are you still awake? She thought that maybe he had cried himself to sleep, but she didn't find it very healthy for the boy to be sleeping under this many layers. Surely he would get hot. It was summer after all, and she didn't want him to suffocate. So she gently pulled the covers down, but to her surprise, she saw nothing but pillows. She stood. Indra? She looked under the bed. Indra! She opened the closets. A manservant came to the door when he heard her. Is something the matter, milady? She looked to him. Scour the house. Indra is missing. Call in a search party. We need to find my son. And so the various servants began getting together to search near and far. Unbeknownst to them, Indra was already on his way back. He had a thousand yard stare, his mouth agape with what he had just seen. He walked back to the house and sat down on the stairs of the porch. A servant walked by and stopped at the door and looked out, calling for Kaguya. Kaguya then pat the servant on the shoulder and told her to call off the search. She went out to speak with her son. She slowly descended the stairs and sat down beside him. Indra looked at her out of the corner of his eyes before turning to face away. Kaguya stopped her hand from touching him. She spoke. So, where did you go? Indra didn't answer. She waited for a moment to give him ample time just in case. You didn't get hurt while you were out, did you? If you did, I would love to make it better. He shook his head. Kaguya just sat there on the stairs for a moment. I'm sorry. Indra's ears twitched at the sound of the apology. Kaguya continued. I didn't mean what I said, Indra. I struck you, and that was not a proper reaction. You deserved punishment, yes, but I feel as though I went overboard by striking you like that. Can I at least see your cheek, please? He looked back at her, tears in his eyes. She noticed a blue patch. She didn't think that he had hit him this hard. She put her hand gently on his cheek to heal it. She looked into his large, glassy eyes and spoke. When I said that I would take your chakra away, I, I didn't mean it, baby. Tears dripped from his eyes. Kaguya looked down at him. You never have to be scared of me. I swear on my life, and let me be cut down and killed should I break this oath. I will never take your chakra away from you. I won't kill you, my precious son. That I swear to you now. She pulled Indra into her bosom to hug. She had told him not to be afraid, but Indra was afraid. He went to the mountain. He saw the god tree. He knew what happened to the people sent to serve it. He knew what his mother was doing to people, and it terrified him. After a moment in her embrace, Kage arose and offered her hand. Come, I want you to see Ashura. She led Indra in to see Ashura. Ashura looked over and saw Indra and recoiled for a second. Kage walked to Indra and put her hand on his shoulder and looked down to him. Go on. Indra looked up at her and said to Ashura, Sorry. Ashura sat there for a second, just looking at him, and then he looked up to Kaguya. She smiled. Don't you have something to say, Shuri? Ashura looked down at Indra. I forgive you. Kaguya smiled, hearing the two children make up. Deep down, though, Ashura knew that Indra didn't mean it. Scariest thing of all, Indra didn't regret hurting him. In fact, Indra was glad. He was glad at seeing how badly Ashura had been hurt. 
But then, why was he apologizing? Ashura sensed an unusual amount of fear from Indra. Had Mother threatened him? Ashura decided to let it go. And even if the apology was hollow, he would forgive him specifically because he loved him. And that was the last time they spoke on that situation. Years passed, and Indra and Ashura had grown up into strong young men. Ashura's burn scars never truly went away, and they continued to hurt night after night, but he was coping in his own way. Laying in bed at night, he would clear his mind, let his worries go, relax his muscles, and focus only on his breathing. This helped him take his mind off the pain and helped him get to sleep quicker. Indra, of course, always seemed tired. He always had dark circles around his eyes. Or perhaps that was just emo eyeliner. Kageya ruled the people as she always had, like a business or a life support system for her own happiness. Ashura was basically her ambassador, and he had a way with words. These words eventually caught the eye of a girl about his age named Hauri. Hauri was a kind and gentle woman, beautiful and possessing of an open heart. The two fell in love almost immediately, and it was believed by the two that they should wed. Ashura would go to his mother and tell her about it. He would speak of the girl with long dark hair, whose eyes glowed like the sun, and whose smile was like sunshine. Kaguya listened to the way he spoke, and she felt a sudden fear in her heart. At first, she attempted to shut it down. She said that no son of hers would marry a peasant girl. Ashura was stunned. Kaguya told him that he would be better to wait until the perfect spouse arose. To be honest though, this had far less to do with Hauri and more to do with Kaguya. She loved her son dearly and found that his kind heart was the only thing helping her maintain her sanity. Her reasons for this were completely selfish. Ashura, however, did not give in as was expected. So often he'd defer to his mother's wishes no matter what they were. Today though, he instead decided to fight back. He was refusing her. He refused to give up on his and Hauri's love. And this became the first real argument that Ashura and Kaguya ever had. Ashura rushed to his room and closed the door. Kaguya sat there in shock, unsure of what to do now. Unbeknownst to either of them, Indra was listening in. As Ashura lay in his bed in his room, he contemplated everything he was facing and eventually decided that he would sneak out of the castle and run away with his love to elope. All the while he was planning his escape, Indra had shown up at the home of Hauri. She sat up in bed and looked to the door where she saw a single dark silhouette against the moonlight and only a pair of ruby red eyes looking in at her. Hauri, he said. She looked up. Lord Indra, what brings you to my house? He stepped in and lit a candle. I come with a request from my mother. She has heard the plight borne by you and Ashura in regards to your love. Hauri listened in as Ashura continued. She's skeptical of allowing her son, an heir to her throne, to marry a low-born peasant. This brought a look of sorrowful disappointment to Hauri's face, but her expression perked the moment she heard Indra say, but she has decided to overlook this if you do one thing to prove your loyalty. Hauri stood. Anything. Indra smiled. She asks that you serve the God Tree for one year. At the end of this year, she will give you her blessing, and you and Ashura will marry. Hauri smiled. One year. That will be nothing to wait for. I'll do it. Indra's smile grew. Good. Now let's write my mother for Ashura. Your words and reasoning will be better for him than mine or my mother's explanation. Hauri nodded and began to write him a letter. Ashura had already put together a pack of all the things he would need. He would step to the window and throw one leg over the side. As his hand grabbed the window frame, he saw the burns on his body. Oh, how many times had these scars hurt him and his mother coddled him until the pain had subsided. But for that reason, he felt a sudden sorrow in his heart. But this feeling was quickly replaced by happiness and excitement, remembering that these same scars had been salved by Hauri's love and affection during the times they'd been together. And so he climbed out the window. At this time, Kaguya sat upon her throne thinking, contemplating the fight. She began to feel that she was wrong in what she had said. She was just so scared. Scared of losing her son. She was clinging so tightly that she had finally realized the truth. She needed him more than he needed her, and that hurt to admit. But at the same time, she remembered an old saying, If you love someone, set them free. And that pain in her heart ached, but she loved Ashura more than she loved herself. And so she stood from her throne and made her way to his bedroom and knocked. Each moment she waited, she felt as though she might die. She heard her heart beat and felt the stress welling up inside of her. But she loved her child, and his happiness would be her happiness. She knocked again and heard no response. She opened the door, only to see that he was gone. Ashura raced to her home where he knocked. Hauri! Hauri, open the door! He called out as he looked behind. Hauri! She's not here, a voice said. Ashura turned back to see Indra standing there. Indra! Indra stepped forward. She isn't here anymore. This is why. He held up a letter and showed it to him. Ashura took the letter. It was Hauri's handwriting. It said, To my love, my light, and my life. Dear Ashura, our love was contested and I know this must frustrate you. 
but your mother, in her infinite kindness, has decided to bless our wedding should I do one thing to prove myself. For one year, I will go to the mountain and serve the god tree. While there, my thoughts shall only be of you and the day that I will be free of this duty, so that I may once more take up the duty I have in you. I cannot wait for you to hold me in your arms and fulfill our dreams together. Yours faithfully, truly, and always with love and affection, Hauri. Ashura looked it over. W what is this? Mother has decided to accept our marriage? Indra shook his head. No, this is not Mother's acceptance. There's a dark secret about our mother that you do not know. It's why our mother and ourselves are the only ones to be born with chakra, and it's why the surrounding nations are beginning to die of starvation. Ashura was confused. Indra put his hand on his shoulder and spoke. I must show you the truth I've discovered. The truth of the god tree. And so Indra led Ashura up the mountain. They continued to track to the top until it came into view. The tree. At the roots, there were bodies, drained dry of their chakra. Indra spoke. This is what it means to serve the god tree. Our mother sent Hauri to die. Tears welled up in Ashura's eyes. No, that isn't true. Our mother isn't like this. Indra sighed. You always refuse to see what's before your own eyes, my ignorant little brother. Our mother is not a good person. She never was. And it will only be a matter of time before we too end up here. Ashura stepped out. Hauri! Hauri! He fell to his knees as Indra came up behind him. It's too late, Ashura. She's already been absorbed. Your love is gone. Ashura began to cry. Indra's eyes began to glow red, slowly turning into a swirl. He knelt down by Ashura and looked him into the eyes. Is life really worth living without Hauri? Ashura sat there, looking up into his brother's eyes. Indra's eyes showed kindness, his words understanding. It was almost as if Ashura were spellbound by every word he spoke. Is your life worth it, knowing that your only chance at love has been taken by mother? Surely you are in unimaginable pain. I want to help you out of this pain. Can you think of any way to end your own suffering? Perhaps, perhaps in death, you and Hauri can be together again. But that's what I'm saying. I don't want you to die, but all the same, I want you to be happy, no matter what side of the great beyond you're on. Indra put a knife in his brother's hands. Don't be afraid of the pain, Ashura. There's nothing to be scared of. Ashura raised the blade and placed the tip against his own stomach. All the while, behind Indra's eyes, there was a hidden joy. Ecstasy knowing his brother would soon be destroyed. Ashura blinked and dropped the blade. No. Indra was confused. What? Ashura spoke again. No, I don't want to die. Indra realized that his genjutsu was backfiring on him, but how? Ashura had little to no training with ninjutsu and absolutely no training in genjutsu. How was he resisting? You, you don't want to? Ashura, still in a daze, shook his head. I don't want to die. Indra pressed a little harder. Are you sure? Hauri's there. Ashura shook his head. Indra began to change his strategy. He tossed the blade aside. Of course not. I would never want you to do that. Why would you even suggest such a thing, Ashura? I love you too much to watch you die. Hauri wouldn't want this either. I'm always here for you. Remember to always speak to me about these feelings you get. I wouldn't want you acting alone and hurting yourself. He said these things as he cast a new genjutsu to hide his presence in the least. Ashura may have fought back against Indra's first genjutsu because something precious to him was involved. But now he was simply trying to make him believe what he wanted to believe, which would make things easier. Ashura nodded. I'm sorry. I won't try it again. Indra smiled and touched heads with his brother. I'm glad. But now comes the bigger question. What are we going to do? Will we let mom get away with this? Hauri isn't the only person who died. They all demand justice, correct? Ashura nodded. Yes. She must pay. Indra's smile returned. Go. Train your hardest. I'll deal with mother and buy you time. When you return, we'll stand together as brothers against her. Indra would then disappear. Kaguya sat upon her throne in worry, wondering what had happened to her son. She assumed he had run away to marry that girl. She was sad because things were left on such a bad note. She wanted to put things right first, so she began to send out a search party. It was then that Indra rushed in, tripping on himself, his hands and clothes covered in blood. Kaguya stood up. Indra, what happened? She rushed to her child and held him up. Are you hurt? What happened? Indra looked up. Mother, it's Ashura. I found him. He and his lover, they... He managed to force out a tear. They killed themselves. Kaguya was startled by this. They... What? Indra nodded. They too killed themselves. They did not wish to be apart, and if you wouldn't let them be in love in life, then they'd be in love in death. Kaguya didn't wish to believe this, but Indra insisted it was true. He led her to the location, Hauri's home. Within, there were two bodies, that of Ashura and that of Hauri. Kaguya came to Ashura's side and held him up. 
Both had committed harakiri, knives deep within their stomachs. Ind represented a letter. It read like this. Let this letter be our last mark on this cruel and unfair world. Love is what keeps us alive. And if one refuses to accept their love, then they refuse to accept our lives and thus must accept our deaths. Nobody will keep myself and my love apart. And so we have decided to shed this mortal coil and move on to the afterlife where we can be happy together for eternity. The final farewell is to you, mother, Ashura. Kaguya read this and broke down into tears. All the while, Indra lingered above her fighting a smile. It was tricky setting up a scene like this. He had hoped originally that he could convince his brother to commit suicide over his love, but when Ashura refused, Indra believed he could make use of him later. The letter, of course, was written by Indra himself. He had studied Ashura's handwriting via his Sharingan, but the real trick was the bodies. Ashura indeed was still alive, but Indra needed to prove him to be dead. So he cast two villagers under Genjutsu with his Mongekyo and proceeded to force them to use the Shadow Mirror Body Changing Method to permanently transform their bodies into that of Ashura and Hauri, before walking them back to this house and forcing them to kill themselves. In doing so, he got blood on his clothes, but this didn't hurt his story at all. In fact, it helped sell it. It portrayed him as the brother who cared enough to cradle his dying brother. He could play sympathy off this. In secret though, he hoped that this would be enough for his mother to commit suicide. He would one day have her throne and her power. Maybe she would never steal his chakra, but he was intent on stealing hers. He would take her power and he would claim her god tree and the next chakra fruit it bore. And by that time, no matter what training Ashura did, he would never beat him. Ashura had wandered in the wilderness for days. He was beginning to lose hope. Having run out of food and water, he collapsed by the stone he felt he had walked by three times already. No matter which direction he took, he always ended up back here. He hit the ground, unable to go any further, and began to accept the fact that he might die. It was then that a toad landed on his head. Ribbit. He could barely respond to it. It jumped from his head and landed before him. Ribbit. Ashura managed to raise his head to look. He wondered if he might be able to survive by eating this toad. His hand reached out and he attempted to grab it. Hey, watch out you moron, I'm not for eating. Ashura heard these words and his tired eyes widened as far as they could. Oh great, I'm hallucinating now. His face lowered into the dirt in front of him. Oh dear, looks like you need some help. Ashura wasn't sure how long he was out for, but he remembers waking up under the low hanging leaves of a tree, being tended to by toads. His eyes open. Where am I? The toad that rescued him spoke. You're on Mount Myoboku home of the Toad Sages. M Mount Myoboku? Ashura was confused. He had never heard of this place before. His expressions didn't change. The Toad spoke. What's the matter, child? Why are you so upset? Ashura spoke. I come from a land of plenty, ruled by my mother. But I came to learn a horrible truth. My mother is an inhuman monster who's been killing our citizens to increase her power. And in the process, she killed the one girl I loved in this world. The Toad nodded. I see, I see. And so you left to escape her. No, Ashura said. I left to grow stronger. I love my mother, but she needs to be stopped, no matter what the cost. If I don't, not only will the people of my kingdom be sacrificed, but my mother will also allow the surrounding kingdoms to perish through starvation, as her god tree is absorbing all the life in the soil. The toad's eyes widened a little to show how serious this had become. Your mother is killing the earth with her god tree. It sounds like it's absorbing nature energy, and she gains power from this energy? Ashura nodded. The toad spoke. Then I shall teach you our techniques. I will teach you how to fight back and how to absorb nature energy on your own. I'll make you into a sage. Tell me, child, what's your name? My name is Ashura, Ashura Otsutsuki. The toad smiled. It's a pleasure to meet you, Ashura. I'm Gamamaru. And so Ashura rested for a few days and continued to be fed by the toads. It was hard to survive starvation on this mountain as the toad's idea of food was something that you could only eat if you were in a real Hakuna Matata mindset. But eventually his strength did return and he was able to begin his training. This consisted of meditation and nature energy absorption. Remember, Gamamaru told him, to absorb nature energy, one must be like a tree. A tree does not move. It merely takes in CO2 and converts the carbon, taking it into its trunk before releasing the oxygen out. Be like a tree, do not move. Merely take in what's already around you as if you were photosynthetic. Ashura did as he was commanded, but slowly began to mutate. Gamamaru beat the energy out of him with a stick. Ashura rubbed the back of his head in agony. Remember, taking in sage energy is like breathing. Don't keep sucking in air until your lungs explode, you gotta let some out. Know your limits and don't go beyond a perfect balance. Sorry, Ashura said. Gamamaru laughed. You're doing fine. Ashura continued to train with this until he began to learn balance. 
Good, Gamamaru spoke. You have now found balance. Continue to practice this daily and you'll find balance easier to get and maintain. By that point, the only thing you'll need to do to improve is learn how to absorb nature energy at a faster rate. One day you'll be able to fight for days on end and then stop and take in more nature energy in but a couple of seconds and then be ready to fight for another couple days. Ashura smiled and continued to do as he had been taught. He also began to learn the basics of frog kata, a special martial art. He began to learn how to utilize various jutsu and even mold chakra into different shapes. Considering he had very little practice with ninjutsu, Gamamaru was surprised at how quickly he was learning and developing sage techniques and jutsu. Eventually, the time came that Ashura felt he could confront his mother competently, and so he bid them farewell. It was time that he returned to the Land of Ancestors, where he planned to make his mother pay for the lives she had taken. Ashura was walking back from the Mount of the Toad Sages. He had confidence in every stride. He had grown so strong in the time he'd been training. Perhaps this potential had always been there and he merely had not let it be realized. He'd been holding himself back. He'd been sheltered. He let himself be coddled for so long and because of that, he'd been pacified. But Indra had opened his eyes to the truth. Their mother was... He stopped for a moment as he couldn't bring himself to say more. Their mother. He couldn't help but look back on every moment with her. Every time she allowed him to dive into the deepest recesses of her heart, every time he had invited her into his, was that all really a lie? He thought about her, but then he thought about her reaction to Hauri and how she sent her to die, how selfish she had been. She was a murderer and a liar. Ashura had been taken in by it. He had felt everything in her heart, and now what he experienced and what was reality was out of sync. His mother and who she was had become so skewed that he didn't know what was true anymore. The past he clinged onto, the love he knew he'd experienced, and the reality where they found themselves. The reality in which his mother was a vile leech, an enchantress to cast her spell over all. Ashura simply sat on the fence of justified hatred and sorrowful love, but at the same time he kept true to what he knew was right, and regardless of his feelings, he knew what she was doing. What she had done was wrong, and so he marched on toward fate, until he could stop her, until he could understand, or until he perished. No matter the outcome, he hoped that the clouded thoughts in his head would be resolved, and deep down he hoped that his mother would forsake this and return to him. Indra stood there by the porch, looking out against the dark skies and the god tree that loomed in the distant mountains like a lone sentry against the night. Their mother had gone there to tend to it. Indeed, he had pushed his mother to depression, but she yet fought to live. Her entire demeanor had changed though. She was hardly hiding anymore what she was doing. She had rounded up many of the villagers, manservants, maidservants, men, women, and even children, and had led them up to the god tree to serve it. In a way, even Indra was disgusted by this, not because of her actions, but because of her reactions. She had given up on all life on Earth just because Ashura had supposedly committed suicide. His lip turned up into a snarl as he turned around and walked a little deeper into the castle. He found his mother's throne and he situated himself sitting down upon it. There he slumped, his hand holding his head up as he thought about his plan, about where he was currently in the progression of it and what was left to do. It was fine that she was feeding the villagers to it. All that meant was that soon they would produce a second chakra fruit, and when it was fully cultivated, he would pluck it from the tree and would devour it before her and gain power beyond her. He would gain the power to dethrone and kill her, absorbing her chakra. And when he did, he would search the stars for a new world to conquer, a new world to hold a god tree. He would become the strongest in the universe, and he would transcend into godhood. All he had to do was wait but a little while. Ashura would return to his home, to the land of ancestors, and there he saw it desolate, with the only lights and life shown to be present being in the sparsely lit castle where he had once made his abode. Above him, the moon was full. It cast its blue light down upon the surface where Ashura strode. Where is everyone? He asked to himself as he drew closer to the castle. Passing the large gate that led home, he stepped through the path in the garden up to the stairs where he ascended. It was not long until he saw Indra sitting slumped on the throne. Indra's face had been twisted in sorrow and despair. Ashura walked up to him. Brother, what's going on? Where is everyone? Forcing a tear, Indra looked up. I couldn't do it, Shuri. I couldn't stop her. Ashura took a breath and prepared to ask the question that he was afraid he knew the answer to. Stop her from what? Indra sat forward and wiped his face. 
Our mother took all of the villagers to the god tree. When you left the village, she knew the time would come to pass that you would return, and so she's trying to cultivate some fruit and grow stronger to stop you from defeating her and seizing the throne. Ashura was startled. My mother's really been doing this? But I thought she loved us. She's really preparing to kill me. Indra nodded. We've been gaslit, Ashura. She never loved us. She was cultivating us, too. When we were born, we received just a seedling of her chakra. And through our training and care, we grew, and the chakra we had began to increase to nearly the level she had upon eating the fruit. She cultivated us into chakra fruit. She'll soon devour us, and I fear she will not stop until the entirety of this world has been devoured and absorbed into her own power. She wants to become a god. Ashura could hardly believe this. He thought he had known his mother, but her actions weren't making any sense. He had been in her heart. He was the only one who truly knew her deep down, or so he thought, because her actions right now flew in the face of everything he thought he knew. Ashura nodded. Then we must stop her at all costs. Come, brother, we'll stand against her. Indra stood and approached him in desperation. You can't be serious. She's too powerful by now. Ashura gripped his brother in love. So long as we two stand together in unity, there's nothing we cannot do. He kissed Indra's cheek. He then stepped back and produced two shadow clones and allowed them to begin gathering nature energy. Indra looked at this. What is this that you're doing? Ashura looked at him, his pure white Byakugan facing his brother. I am preparing to absorb nature energy and enter sage mode. Indra nodded. Sage energy, like the god tree does. Ashura nodded. It's the same concept. Indra, seeing this, had begun to wonder just how powerful Ashura had become. He had learned to emulate the god tree's ability to absorb energy and transform it into chakra. He needed to keep an eye on this. He then took his brother by the hand and the two made their way up the mountain toward the god tree. They passed through the underbrush and scaled the mountain until they reached a cleft in the side of it. They passed through and into the open. There they saw Kageya standing, facing the massive tree. As they spoke, a single fruit was appearing. It was a single fruit, but packed to the brim with chakra. Ashura cried out, Mother! Kaguya stopped and for a moment did not turn to face them, as she was trying to process this sound, testing to see if it were reality or merely a memory eating away at her soul. She turned back and looked to see Ashura. Sh Shuri! She was startled and didn't know how to react. Tears began to form in her eyes as she rushed to him. She took her son in her arms and looked him over. The burn scars on the side of his face and on his hands. It was truly him. She began to cry harder as a smile came to her face. I thought you were dead. I believed you had killed yourself. Ashura shook his head, pushed her back. She was startled. Ashura. He looked at her in disgust and then looked at the tree itself. What have you done, mother? She looked back. I took the people and fed them to the tree. Ashura grit his teeth. I can't believe you. I thought you were dead, she cried out at him. You know, maybe that doesn't excuse it, but I couldn't just... She stopped. I loved you. To death, Ashura. I would have killed for you. Died for you. Ashura then spoke. You fed these people to the tree just so you could fight back against me. You knew I wasn't dead. You knew I was coming back to remove you from the throne. And so you fed these people to the tree to prepare to fight me. Kaguya was shocked. No, I would never do that. I would never try to hurt you, she said. Ashura in anger growled at her. Then why did you kill Hauri? Kaguya was confused. I... Shuri, I never killed Hauri. I thought you and she committed suicide because of me. I was going to give you my blessing, but you had already left, and by the time we found you, we thought you and she had died. Ashura's brow furrowed. What? Is that some lie? Kaguya shook her head. No, it was Indra who found your bodies. Indra was the one who told me the two of you had killed yourselves. Indra, you have to explain to your brother. Ashura looked to Indra. Indra began to laugh. Indeed, I did tell her that. I showed her everything. I made her believe that you two had perished. Ashura was confused. And Hauri? Indra looked to Ashura. She is truly dead. I made sure of that myself. He stepped out into the moonlight before them. You see, I was the one who set all this up and manipulated you into believing everything that you do. In truth, I had hoped that by killing Hauri that you might kill yourself, Ashura. I even tried to convince you, but you resisted, so I had to backtrack and find another solution. I decided to blame it all on Mother and send you on some quest to dethrone her, and all the while had hoped that Mother would react in such a way that would grant me control. And while she also failed to kill herself, she was so lost in grief that she forgot herself. She lost what little humanity existed within her and fed all of the villagers to the god tree. 
Indra laughed again. This may not have been exactly my design, but it worked out in the end. The villagers have become one with the tree, and a new divine fruit has been created. And now, there are but two loose ends left to clean up. Honestly, this worked out better than I could have hoped, because now I can absorb your chakra too. Ashura and Kaguya were surprised. Brother, Kaguya was shocked at this explanation. Indy? Indra looked back at them. Quit calling me that, he shouted. I am not Indy and I am not your brother. I will become a god and remake the world to be as I see fit. Kaguya rushed out to Indra. Indra, what has happened to you? Why are you doing this? Why do you hate me so? Why do you hate your brother? All we've ever done is love you. Indra backhanded her. Love. You've never once loved me. All you two have ever loved was each other. Ashura and Kaguya, the cutest mother and son ever. That's what the villagers called you. I was just Indra, the forgotten. I studied and trained and learned to mold my chakra in different ways. Weaponize it so I could always protect you. Protect Ashura. I grew strong for you. And any time I wanted the same love Ashura got from you, you always turned away from me. Well now, now I'm turning away from you. If you don't love me, if the village doesn't love me, then I'll destroy it all. I'll destroy the whole world and remake it into a new world where I will be loved the most, where I'll be the favorite. I'll make a new brother and a new mom and you, you two can just go to hell. He hovered up to the tree and took the fruit and bit into it, absorbing the chakra. Suddenly, his two Mangekyo Sharingan mutated into Rinnegan. He hovered above them. I'll claim your chakra, mother. Brother. Ashura looked up at him. Indra! Kaguya held out her hand. Stop, Shuri. Ashura looked to his mother, and she looked to him. I did this to him. I'd always believed myself to be a good mother, to pay attention to each of my children. But now I've come to realize that I only ever showed you the love you deserved, and I shunned Indra. I turned him into this. Now I've got to save him. Please, let me deal with this. Ashura seemed reluctant, but he nodded and allowed her to step out. Kaguya walked out to meet him. Indy, I failed you, she said as she stepped forward. I never saw you for who you truly were. I only ever compared you to your brother, and that was unfair. If I could go back now, I would ensure to never treat you like that again, but time doesn't work like that. She held out her hand. All I can do is offer you the love you always deserved now. Please, come down to me and take my hand. I love you. Indra hovered above and growled. If you love me, then die. He formed about 12 chakra rods and fired them down at her. Ashura quickly stepped in the way and utilized the 8 trigrams palm rotation to defend Kaguya. He knocked away the chakra rods. How dare you attempt to kill our mother? Indra laughed. Hypocritical of you, I dare say. Did you not come here to kill her yourself? The shoe only stinks when it's on the other foot. Ashura stopped for a moment and looked back. I never intended to kill our mother. I wanted to stop her, yes, but I would never kill her. I would have saved her. He looked forward. I would have saved her, just as I'm going to save you too. He rushed forward with his sage mode activated. Indra would fire down upon him chakra rod after chakra rod. Some Ashura could dodge and others he would have to block. He managed to push through and the moment he jumped into the air to strike Indra, Indra utilized the diva path to push Ashura back and away. Ashura skid to a stop. Kaguya came to him and helped him up. Don't worry, I'm with you. She stood there and opened her third eye, her Rene Sharingan. It was this eye from which you were born, Indra. With this eye, I held a vision that you would one day be a great warrior. I see now that it was a prophecy fulfilled, but I do so wish that it had not. I would not have sacrificed you for strength. Indra smirked. It's so easy to say that now that you realize that you can't beat me. Kaguya rushed forward. With her Rinne Sharingan, she tapped into her diva path to push against Indra's diva path just to get up and close to him. They wrestled for a moment to the air as their bodies hit the ground. Ashura rushed in, his Byakugan active. This was the one thing he had on Indra. Indra did not possess the Byakugan like he did. Instead, Indra possessed the Sharingan, which could not see Tenketsu. Ashura had trained in such a way as to make up for Indra's shortcomings when he thought that their mother would be the only one they would fight. Now his techniques were capable of allowing him to strike where Indra was weakest. You should have killed me when you had the chance, Ashura shouted as he rushed in with his palm out, ready to strike the Tenketsu on Indra's body and pacify him before he could hurt anyone else. Indra's Rinnegan quickly passed between Kaguya, Ashura, and back again, attempting to see them both at the same time. The one benefit his Sharingan had lost over the Byakugan his brother had been born with. He kicked Kaguya back powerfully and spun under Ashura's punch before activating the Ashura path, which Indra believed to be finally named, considering that it was about to kill his brother. 
A large metal blade protruded from his arm and stabbed Ashura in the stomach. Ashura was struck, and he just stood there silently for a moment as blood dripped from his mouth. He looked down at his brother's sneer, a satisfied smile playing on his lips as he pulled the blade back and switched to the diva path to push Ashura away. Ashura rolled. He began to bleed. Kaguya stood and ran over to him. Shuri! Indra crossed his arms as he watched. As you can see, mother, I was always the superior son. Eldest by a few minutes, I was always a step ahead of him, no matter what. Kaguya knelt down to see blood pouring from the wound. Shuri! She cried out as she held him in her arms. Ashura looked up. M mother I... She rubbed his face. Don't try to speak. Save your strength. I'll heal you. She began attempting to heal him, but it was too late. He was slipping away. In one moment, he curled up in her arms as he had when he was but a child. She recalled that this had been his reaction when Indra had burned him. And now that he was dying, it was once more this reaction. She cradled her son and held him close. She continued trying to heal him. He looked up. Mom, I am upset at you. She looked down at him and nodded. He continued, You killed so many people just because of me? She shook her head. No, I killed them to protect you. And when I thought you died, I knew, I knew I couldn't lose Indra too. So I began cultivating a fruit. I never told you about my clan. They come from the heavens and I've made enemies of them. They'll come one day, one day soon. I didn't want to lose you to them, even if I had to become a devil. He smiled softly. There are some things we can't change, Mom. Even if it means letting go, we must protect this world. Our people. It's why I was born. I protect people and love them. You helped me learn that. I just wish I could have saved Indra too. Ashura looked down, feeling like a failure. He had always felt like a failure, and now it had all come full circle. He was a failure. He had always failed in everything he did, and he was failing again now. Slowly, his life ebbed away. Kaguya kept holding him. Indra looked down on them as he hovered in the sky, touching. Kaguya looked back at him. Indra's judging gaze was cast down upon her like some god viewing an unworthy mortal. If that had been me, would you have cried? I would have died for you, she cried out to Indra. She looked down at Ashura. I still would, and I will. She put her hand on Ashura's cheek and closed her eyes. She began to glow as color returned to Ashura's face. Ashura opened his eyes. Huh? Kaguya smiled, seeing him return to life. She sat him up. Ashura looked at her. M mother how am I alive? She smiled as her body began to fade to dust. A life for a life, the power of the outer path. Ashura was shocked. He held her as she began to fade away. Why did you do this? Kaguya looked at him as she lay in his arms. Because it's what I deserve. I sacrificed so much for my own sake that it's time I sacrifice for someone else. As she lay there in his arms, her eyes closed and she took a deep breath. Shuri, you're the only one who can save Indra. I failed him, but you, you can redeem him. You can succeed where I failed. I've never seen a heart like yours. Let it guide you, give you strength, and where your strength fails, let mine empower you. She touched her hand to his cheek and there she passed her chakra into Ashura. He felt a sudden burst of energy that seemed to blow his hair back like a gale force wind. Kaguya smiled. I believe in you, Ashura. She then faded into the light that passed back to the stars from which she came. Ashura sat there. Indra looked down on him. Damn it. That chakra is mine. You will give it to me. He rushed down at him. Ashura stood and with a powerful release of pressure knocked Indra back. Indra skid across the ground, keeping his balance. He looked into his brother's eyes. Ashura looked up. His Byakugan had themselves mutated through the power of Six Paths Chakra. His eyes had turned to Tensaigon, the Six Paths variant of the Byakugan, the rival of the Rinnegan. But further still, in the center of his head, a single red Rinne Sharingan appeared. Ashura suddenly transformed, a powerful cyan-colored chakra coating his body, as if his entire being had been composed of stardust. He lifted into the air, as about his body, multiple glowing truth-seeking orbs appeared, floating. He rushed forward toward Indra, striking him in the jaw, knocking him into the stone. Ashura was on him in a minute. Indra lifted his hand to release a Diva Path Almighty Push, but Ashura utilized his Tensaigon's gravity control to cancel out this Almighty Push. As strong as the Rinnegan was, the Tensaigon had one thing on it. While it lacked all of the fancy paths, it possessed gravity control strong enough that even a moon might be shattered under its pull. That was stronger than any Rinnegan could do alone. He smashed into Indra again, knocking him through the rock. Indra shot up into the sky, out of the smoke clouds like a rocket. 
Once he was in the air, he shook his head and looked down into the clouds of dust, trying to scan for Ashura. Sadly, his Rinnegan could not see through gases like this. Ashura was having no issues looking at him through his Tensaigon. The Tensaigon, being an evolved form of the Byakugan, retained all of its previous abilities, and among these was X-ray vision. The golden lotuses in the blue irises of his Tensaigon glowed as he viewed Indra from below. Indra began to blindly fire black chakra rods down at Ashura from above. The shots all missed their mark by what seemed like a country mile. Ashura suddenly shot up into the sky and grabbed Indra by the leg and threw him down to the ground. Indra struck the earth and lay there for a moment as Ashura came down. Indra stood, gripping his left shoulder as it felt like it had been pulled out of socket. Ashura stepped closer, and once he was in range, he lowered his stance. Eight trigrams, 64 palms. He suddenly rushed at Indra. Two palms, four palms, eight palms. He began to strike out quickly at the Tenketsu that he witnessed with his Tensaigon. He was hoping to incapacitate Indra so that he could end the battle without blood. 16 palms, 32 palms, 64 palms. He shouted as his striking speed doubled with every round. Finally, he struck Indra and knocked him back into the tree. Indra lay against the tree, barely able to move as many of his tenketsu were closed, limiting the flow of chakra. He could only weakly move his fingers and toes. Anything beyond that was too taxing. How was this possible? How could the weak child Ashura surpass his brother? The Rinnegan was a superior dojutsu compared to the Tensaigon. It had more abilities, more powers, and yet he was losing. Why? As if he was reading his mind, Ashura spoke. Do you know why you lose? You lose because you're not using your dojutsu to its fullest potential. But further, it's because I want it more. I want to save you. You want to kill me, or so you say, but I want to save you. And even if I have to die to bring you back from this darkness, I will. As if blocking out anything that Ashura had said, Indra scoffed. Not using my dojutsu to its fullest potential, you say. Perhaps I should rectify that. Suddenly, from his back, multiple chakra chains shot out. They wrapped around the tree and began to pull it into him. Ashura stood there on guard, watching. Indra pulled it in and suddenly felt another consciousness. A beast. It roared in his mind as powerful as nature itself. Indra screamed in agony as he felt his psyche being ripped apart by instinct. The instinct to kill and destroy. Too much! It's too much power! He shouted. I'm losing control! He grabbed his head and leaned forward. It felt like he was being dragged into a chasm with no way out, nothing to grip to slow himself down. Suddenly, he remembered the throne. He remembered his mother and his brother. He remembered all of the good times they had together, every hug he received from either of them. He knew that he would recreate the world. He would make a world where that would come to pass again, where he would be the favorite, where a new version of Kaguya and Oshura would live, each one offering him the love he deserved. A world where Haori had chosen him instead. A world where he got to sit on his mother's lap all the time and share her bed. A world where Ashura was there every time he skinned his knee playing. Every time he was sure he broke his shins while practicing Muay Thai. A world of love only for him. And it was that desire, that drive, that pulled him back from the depths. He crawled back up with every ounce of strength that he had, dragging the ten tails with him. This was the world he wanted, and it was the world that he would make. Pulling it up, he absorbed the ten tails into himself. In reality, Ashura was watching this battle unfold, and suddenly, Indra stood up. Nothing but severed roots where the ten tails had once been. Indra looked to his brother, both of his Rinnegan active, and a third eye awakening in his forehead. A Rinne Sharingan, just as Ashura had. Indra would rush at Ashura at breakneck speeds, striking his brother with enough force that the air pressure around them would suddenly change. Ashura was struck so hard that he hit the stone fast enough to break the sound barrier. He sat there in the stone struggling to breathe. He couldn't move. He was just in utter shock. The pain had yet to even catch up. Looking through the dust, he saw Indra casually walking towards him. Ashura wiped his lip of the saliva that had dripped out while he tried to catch his breath. Ashura stepped out of the dust. When he did, Indra rushed at him and tried to strike again. Ashura caught the fist. They pushed so hard against each other that the ground below their feet began to shatter under the pressure. Ashura fell to one knee as Indra pressed harder. He looked to his brother and began to wonder what his current weakness must be. He realized what he had to do. He got into position as Indra came at him. As Indra struck out at Ashura, Indra ducked under the attack and put his palm into his stomach. This stopped Indra in his tracks. Ashura stood and gripped Indra by the back of his neck and pulled his head in to touch the forehead of Ashura. And in that moment, both were transported into the mindscape. Indra looked around at this place and understood. You couldn't beat me physically, so now you're planning to attack my soul. How pitiful. 
Ashura looked at him silently for a moment and then spoke. You know, I've never been here before, he said as he looked around. I've never once been in your heart before. Indra's brow furrowed as he listened silently. Ashura looked around as he stepped about. This place is, it's so empty. Why is it so empty? Because there was nothing worth putting in it, Indra said. Ashura looked at what appeared to be physical manifestations of emotional scars within the center of Indra's being. He touched it and witnessed a memory of murder, a memory of two cherished friends being slaughtered for the power of the Mangekyo Sharingan. Don't touch that, Indra shouted at him. Ashura pulled away. You killed them? You killed your friends for power. Indra then spoke. They meant nothing to me. They never meant anything. It's why I can so easily cast them aside. If they meant nothing, then why do you have their memory so lovingly enshrined in your heart? Why did your Mangekyo Sharingan awaken from their deaths? I think you cared a lot more than you say you did. I want you to stop messing around in here. Leave me alone. Ashura took one look back at Indra and stepped toward him. You know, I always wanted in here. I always wanted into your heart, but I could never make it past the first layer. You were always so prickly. He walked to Indra. Let me in. Indra shook his head. No, I don't want you in here. You never deserved it. You never deserved to be in here. If mom wasn't deserving of it, then how could you ever be? Ashura looked into his brother's eyes. Because I love you. Indra grit his teeth. You only love me now that I'm stronger than you and can kill you. Ashura looked down at his scarred hand. You could always kill me. He looked back up. All I ever wanted was to be let into your heart. Mama let me in, so I stayed close with her. Why won't you let me in? Because I'm scared, Indra shouted. He fell to his knees, and in that moment, the two of them were no older than seven. I'm scared, Ashura. I don't want you to come in. Ashura knelt down next to him. Why? Indra wiped his eyes. Because I'm really weak inside. I gotta be the strong one. That's all I am. That's all I can be. This is the only thing that I can do better than you. I don't want to show anyone how I really feel. I don't want to be obsolete. I don't want to be forgotten. Ashura hugged him. Indra, I don't care if you're weak. Mama didn't care if you were weak. I was weak. I always looked up to you and I still do. You're my brother. I love you. Indra cried on his shoulder. Why did mom have to love you more? Why couldn't she love me too? I always wanted to feel good enough for her and I was never good enough. Ashura held him close. You were always good enough, another voice said. Indra opened his eyes to see Kaguya. Her chakra within Ashura had given her a conduit with which to conduct her spirit. It came to the two children and knelt down, hugging them. I always loved you, Ashura. You were always so guarded. I couldn't get into your heart. I wanted so badly to love you just as I loved Ashura, but you wouldn't let me. You wouldn't let either of us. Indra cried openly, his eyes overflowing with tears. I had to be strong. I read your diary. I knew the Otsutsuki were coming. I wanted to be strong enough to protect you. She kissed his head. I was so unfair to you, but I love you so much. You're my precious child. I could never stop loving you. I wanted to be in your heart just like Ashura. I didn't care if you were weak. I didn't care if your entire persona was a facade. I knew my little boy. I knew who you were, but I dared not force myself in. I wanted you to let me in, but it seems I didn't encourage you enough, and for that, I'm sorry. Indra hugged them both. Mama, I'm sorry I killed you. I'm sorry I got you killed. She kissed his head. I told you I would die for you. Only Ashura could enter your heart. I could not. I just wanted you to be happy, even if I had to die. Indra's grip on Ashura grew tired. I'm sorry I killed your love, Ashura. I was so jealous of you. I wanted her. I wanted her to love me. But when she chose you, Ashura rubbed the back of his head. It's okay, Indra. I know why you did it. They embraced once more. Slowly, Ashura pulled away. I'll always love you, Indra. And in that moment, they were back on the battlefield. Ashura was holding Indra as they both sat on their knees. Indra was crying into his brother's arms. Ashura stroked his brother's back. Shh, it's okay. No need to cry. It's okay. After a moment, Indra pulled back a little and wiped his eyes. No, it's not okay. I unfairly killed so many people because of my own selfishness. I'm so sorry. Ashura touched his head to Indra's. It's okay. I forgive you. Indra shook his head. But I can't forgive myself. I have to make this right. Ashura looked at him curiously. Indra then put his hand to Ashura's chest and transferred the ten tails to him. I've got to make this right. Ashura shook his head. You don't need to do this. Indra looked to his brother and smiled. I do. 
I want to. I want to let you into my heart. I want to expose my true feelings for everyone else, but they can't see if they're dead. He put his hands together and used some Samsara of Heavenly Life to bring back those who had perished at his own hands. Those killed by the Tentails, he brought them back to life. They all appeared in that field as Indra fell forward into Ashura's arms. They gathered around the two as Ashura held him. Indra looked up. I don't need to remake the world anymore. I already have what I want the most. I have the love I wanted so much. He rested his head against Ashura's chest. Thank you, Ashura. If I could go back and do it all over again, I would without a second thought. I hope in the future, I can be your brother again. And if so, I will be sure not to close my heart to you. I love you. And with that, Indra passed away in Ashura's arms. Ashura cried bitter tears for his brother. Hauri knelt down next to them and put her hand on Indra while looking to Ashura. She kissed him. From there, Ashura began to lead the people forward in love and peace. He taught them how to use their chakra to connect with others and spread their love from person to person. Eventually, Ashura married Hauri and produced two sons. He named them Hagodomo and Hamada. Hagodomo inherited the same Sharingan as Indra, and Hamada inherited the same eyes as Ashura. He led them both to be strong and wise, but above all, caring. And he was sure to give each child ample amounts of love, so neither felt left out. As time passed, however, and Ashura grew close to death, he utilized the Six Paths technique, creation of all things, to split the Ten Tails into nine separate beasts. And as Ashura perished, he passed his title of Sage of Six Paths down to his sons, both of whom would be known as the Sage of Six Paths. They would lead the future, but as Ashura's bloodline became diluted, the people began to return to the natural state of mankind, which is to say, war. And so the Warring States period would arise, but not without those who would stand together. The Uchiha clan and the Senju clan stuck close, and it was on one particular day that two boys would meet by the river. Hashirama Senju would look up and see another boy there with a smile. The boy would extend his hand. Hi there. I'm Madara. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.